I've been asked to tell my story. Now, don't panic. Before it gets too self-indulgent, uh, I thought I'd share with you my year 10 school photo, just in case, you know, I got a little bit too into it. Um, this is essentially where my story started. I was really lucky. I grew up in a fantastic family. Um, I went to a state school just about 30 minutes from Sheffield. Um, and I knew from about the age of 12 exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a barrister. Um, I knew exactly where I wanted to study. I wanted to go to Cambridge. I pretty much picked out my course. Um, and it was from about this age that all those plans started to fall apart. Uh, now, I went to a technology college. What that meant was that for my GCSEs, I had to choose some sort of you know, resistant materials, systems of control, cooking, kind of textiles. And I decided that I was going to take resistant materials, mainly down to the fantastic teacher that took it, Mr. Stokes. Um, he was really, really inspiring. And it had absolutely nothing to do with the fact I was going to be one of two girls in the class. Can I just put that out there now? Um, and I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed coming up with ideas and making things. But I was not looking forward to my coursework, because every year, Every student in the class had to do a topic on storage. And as a girl, I was expected to design a jewellery box. And I really, really didn't want to do it. It was just really boring. There was nothing new or exciting about it. So the day that was announced, I sat at the back of the class and I sulked. And now that wasn't like me. I was fairly academic and I enjoyed school. And my teacher could tell there was something wrong. And I said, come on, I want a challenge. I don't want to design a jewellery box. I can go to Argos and buy one for like 15 quid. I don't want to do that. Give me a real problem to solve. And so he did. He told me about his father. Now his father had had a stroke and he couldn't use his stairs. But he needed to keep active. He needed to be rehabilitized and he needed to have that exercise. And I sat there, and I listened, and I thought, and if I'm honest, up to that point of being 15 years old, I'd never even considered stairs. They were something that were just there. They were in you know, people's houses. Some people had them, some people didn't. They were in buildings. I'd never even taken any note of them. But I thought, OK, I'll go home, and I'll do some research. And I still wasn't sure whether I'd won, or whether I should have just kept my mouth shut and designed the jewellery box, because stairs weren't particularly sexy. Uh, when I was thinking of a challenge, I thought it was going to come up with something that would be like, wow, like, oh, wow, that's so exciting. But I didn't really get the whole stairs thing. But I went home, and I came across this fact that one in three people over 65 fall on the stairs every year. And I started to do more research, and I found out it was a really big problem. There were lots of people who couldn't use their stairs. They, were, they didn't want a stair lift, maybe. They were too proud to use a stair lift. Um, they needed something to help them walk. And actually, I came across another lot of research which went on about how important the stairs are. It's one of the only few exercises that some people get. Going, lifting, like, when you leave today, just appreciate walking up the stairs because there will come a point in your life when that will become terribly difficult. Now my dad was an ex-car mechanic and he was a computer programmer and he loved like he was the one that would like when we got the Lego out it wasn't really for us it was for him and he had his Meccano but no one could use it because actually we didn't do it properly um, and I rushed back and I told my dad and I was like I've got this project I'm really excited about it I think um, but I'm, I've got a, like a bit of a problem and my dad said the immortal words, well, it's not a proper product unless it has a motor. Um, at which point I kind of switched off because that really didn't interest me. You see, I had this vision in my head. I wasn't an inventor. I didn't see myself as an engineer or being vaguely creative. But I could see, I'd seen Zimmer frames, like walking frames. And I thought, right, wouldn't it be great if you could have something like that that allowed you to walk up and down your own stairs? If you put weight on it, it locked. If you were to fall, it would give you that stability. And that was kind of my idea. And my dad got his books down, he had quite a few of those, and he started to go through and talk to me about motors and how important they were. And I got a little bit bored, and I'm going, yes, Dad, yes, Dad. And we were actually sat in my brother's room. And my brother has um, a toy, uh, and it's 
metal stick and it has on it a little bird which is either a cuckoo or a woodpecker depending where you come from and it like goes down the stick people seen that yeah a few people nodding that's always a good sign sometimes when i talk in schools people are like it doesn't have a battery it's not like a games console uh, but it's very retro toy and i was sat playing with that going up and down the stick and i realized that that had a really simple braking mechanism using friction back in school the next day to tell my teacher you'll never guess what I found at home I've seen this toy and I want to kind of make it on a bigger scale to prove it works so the next recent materials I got on the bus with my scaffolding pole and my block of wood uh, and I rushed into class to show them that I could make it work and there it is I had this locking mechanism using friction I had a handrail people held on to it perfect Okay, so they're really nice, fancy pictures that came about four years after that. The picture on the right was actually what I submitted for my GCSE Resistant Materials project. That was the first ever working model. And what I did was I found materials that, some that slid, so had a low coefficient of friction, and some that locked, that had a high coefficient of friction. And I created a mechanism inside the handle that if you let go or you put your weight on it, it would lock. And it would hold quite a lot of, of weight, really. And that was the basis of the product. And my teacher saw it and thought, I know what to do. We're a school, I know exactly what we have to do with this. We have to enter it into a competition. But as you've probably seen from my demo, my little GCSE project wasn't quite of the high enough caliber to be able to show my product. So this is where Reg came in. Reg is like, if you've seen Back to the Future, like Doc in it, like always coming up with mad inventions, except he doesn't do it in a shed in the bottom of his garden. Reg has a multi-million pound engineering firm, and I turned up at Reg's factory with some drawings and my scaffolding pole, my block of wood, uh, and you could see his face thinking, oh my word, what have I signed up for? Uh, and I explained about my product. I showed him the drawings. Now, if any of you have any ideas, get some good drawings, because that's how I pretty much got Reg on board, and without him, none of the rest of it would have happened if I'd not had some fairly clear drawings. Um, but Reg gave me two really important bits of advice. And the first one was about protecting the product. He was the first person that said, right, here's an NDA, get your teacher to sign it, get your dad to sign it, I'll sign it, and we'll put in a patent. Because no one had seen the product, it was an idea at that point, and he said, you really need to protect it. And I went home and I said to my dad, I don't really know what a pattern is. And I did some research and I was like, but Reg says we can write one, so we'll give it a go. Um, and me and Reg sat down and I submitted my first pattern. The second one was he started to sow a seed and he said, do you know what you should do? You should start a company and you should sell these. Like, I could make them and you could sell them. And I thought, whoa, okay. I'm going to be a barrister. Like, we don't do this sort of thing. Um, <laughs> But he kind of sowed that seed, and I thought, OK, interesting. And he made me a beautiful stainless steel stair study that went on my stand at the Young Engineers in Nottingham. And my teacher went along, and they made me wear this lovely top that said Tomorrow's Engineer on the back of it. Um, and I told people about the product, and I explained about how it had been made, because it allowed me on the factory floor. It actually made bits of the product. Not quite sure where health and safety fits in within that, but anyway. Um, and at the end of the day, they invited me down to London to the finals. Before I left, they gave me a lovely big mark scheme. And on the back, it said, can you sell your product? And I thought, come on. Like, I've solved the problem. Now you want me to look at if I could sell it. But as I'd been judged, these judges had handed me out these business cards. And they had on them, like, managing director, CEO, you know, all sorts of really interesting and fancy titles. And I thought, I know what I could do. I could start a business, I could get business cards, and then that would prove to them that I'd thought about actually selling the product. And so I went and got the yellow pages when it was the proper yellow pages you could prop open doors with, and I found a local accountant. And he came very kindly out of office hours to my parents' house and was greeted by a very giddy 16-year-old going, I'm going to start a company, I'm getting business cards. <laughs> Again, he had that really weird look that Reg had on his face, like, oh my word, what have I let myself in for? But we sat down, and he explained it all, and I started my first company. And it was quite easy, actually, you know, because at 16, I knew exactly what I was going to do. So I was going to be managing director, because I'm a little bit bossy. Um, 
And I thought, well, Reg has done a lot, so let's make him an executive director. He's done, you know, he's really, really supportive, really behind it. That's great. Another person on board. I thought, my dad doesn't quite get the product, really. Um, but, yeah, he's got a nice, you know, he's got a very big car. Now, anyone starting a business will understand the importance of transport, and you could actually fit a product in the back of his car. So, he was a director. And then, it's changed slightly now, but when I started my business, there was a company secretary role, and that was the person that, if it all went wrong, and you did some little bit naughty, uh, they were the person that went to prison. <laughs> so, I gave that to my mum, because she was going <laughs> to... I'm not going to survive in prison. My mum would do much better. And so I had my company, and I had business cards, and I went, you know, again in my tomorrow's engineers top uh, to young engineers, and my teacher very kindly drove down the big demo unit, and I'd persuaded a friend of mine to have a full-size kind of demo unit installed for her 94-year-old mother. She'd signed a disclaimer, it's okay. Um, and she loved the product. She liked the fact she could put a handbag on it. She went up and down the stairs. I had a little video of it and Flo going, oh yeah, it's amazing. Um, that was the only point when my dad went, oh yeah, it actually does work, doesn't it? I was like, great. Um, and I stood there and I smiled and I told people about the product and I explained about it and how I really, you know, by this point, I'd spoke to so many people about this product, I was literally like, this is going to be amazing, this is the best thing ever, like not having slept in three days. Uh, and at the end of it, I was Young Engineer for Britain. <laughs> Which, for someone who didn't know anything about engineering up to that point, was a little bit of a shock. Because I started to get calls from, like, The Guardian and from, you know, national TV wanting my opinion on things. And I was like, hang on, I'm going to be a lawyer, I don't know these things. But this woman on this picture here, Linda Sanford, is probably the person that started me to kind of think, actually, engineering might not be so bad. And I'd say she's my kind of first female role model in this. And she arrived, she, vice president of IBM, private jet arrived, you know, came in, beautiful bag, amazing shoes. <laughs> and I just went, oh, where have they been hiding these female engineers? Like, gosh, they don't look like that on the posters. <laughs> um, and she was, you know, talking to her, I started to think, actually, this is really exciting. Because I love problem solving, I love making things happen, and that's what she did as a job, and it was amazing. Uh, and the next day, they put me on BBC Breakfast TV and News 24 and Five Live Radio, and I was talking about the product, and my dad had done this little video, and that got to go on TV, and he was really excited. But then I had a bit of a dilemma, because of, I think some of it's to do with the school system, but you, you're made to make decisions very early on. Um, and by 12, I, I knew exactly where I was going. But then this happened, and I wasn't really sure what to do. Do I take the path that had been completely planned out, or do I do something a little bit different? Now, when I was in year seven and eight, if you'd have put money on the people that were going to go to university or were going to do particular things, I'd have been in that category. My school had pretty much pushed me down that academic route. N not necessarily in a bad way, but did I, would I want to risk giving that all up to do something with this product? But I decided these things only come around once, and actually at the age of 16, thought, what on earth have I got to lose? Because I can always come back and, you know, go to university later or change career, but I will never get this moment back. And I decided to take the leap. And I had my company, my business cards, uh, I had a laptop, and I had a phone, and we started the business on £1,200. Put an advert out there, we sold 10 products, we got 10 more made. We sold them, we got them made. And bit by bit, we started to build a company. And people were fantastically amazing. Because I realized I had no cash flow. I'd never studied business studies in my life. And suddenly, I had to get this product out there. I had to deal with customers. I had to work out systems. And I loved it. It was amazing. Uh, and bit by bit, we started to grow. And we went to trade shows. I persuaded my parents to let me invest a little bit of the money they'd put aside for me to go to university. And all of that money bought me a one by three meter stand at a trade show at the NEC. Yay. Uh, and a power socket, which was about just as expensive on top of that. Um, and I brought along my sister on some work experience, uh, my mum, the guy that did our website, my dad, and Reg. We got everyone to dress in the same way because obviously 
that's what businesses do. But we were there with our matching things and we stood there at the stand and we were the underdogs. We, I mean, opposite us, we had one of the biggest probably medical companies in the world with their shiny, like, half a million pound stand. And there were us in our little dresses printing off leaflets at the back of our stand. But people liked the product. You know, the BBC turned up, they filmed the product, it started to get momentum. People believed in what we were trying to do. And we didn't have the money to just go out there and do lots of marketing. We had to do things bit by bit and build it up. And I was really lucky with the engineering side as well. I got to go to Intel um, ISEF, which is the International Science and Engineering Fair, which is essentially, if you've never been something like that, it's like um, Miss World for geeks. It's amazing. Um, and we all stand there and we get judged again. And the projects that are out there and the things that young people are doing is truly inspiring. And I sat there and I was like, wow, OK, I've been wasting my life. Um, and I got to do amazing things, uh, speak at events and go out there and speak to young people. And I think so many times people are told they're supposed to do a specific thing. And actually, they don't have to. And it's quite easy for me to stand here and be like, yeah, it's been great. And it hasn't. Things have gone wrong. Horrible things have gone wrong. I have lost my business, well, been so close to it, numerous of occasions. You know, it, it's not easy. But actually, it's been really good fun. And the four things that I think are really important is plan. When you're unsure what's going to happen, just plan that next step. Get advice. You don't have to use it, but get advice from lots of different sources. Surround yourself with the right people. And most importantly, do something that makes you happy. Because even when things don't go right, actually, if you enjoy what you do, it doesn't matter. I actually started other companies. I liked kind of making things happen. Today, you know, you've been very good, thank you. You've listened to my story. But actually, it's about your story. All the things that happened to me were opportunities. But they were only opportunities in hindsight. At the time, they were really risky moves. You know, people were saying, you shouldn't do that. You've got exams. You shouldn't be doing that. You've got this. You've got that. You're supposed to be doing this. And I'm not saying that you should, you know, please all study for exams. But it's about your story. It's about sometimes taking that risk into the unknown. Because unless you take that first step, you're never going to go anywhere. Thank you.